Greetings to the Church of the Living God, wherever you may be, all around the world. Revelation chapter 5, starting in verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals, for you were slaughtered, and you purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have made them into a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Amen. That's you if you are part of the bride, if you are part of the church. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue, all around the world, you have been made part of the bride of Christ. Last time we left off with the bridegroom's pledge. We talked about that being the Holy Spirit as relates to the church. The bridegroom's pledge in the Jewish marriage ceremony was something of great value that was a first installment of future things to come in their union that the bride would would have in her future husband. And for the church, what could be greater than the Holy Spirit, a treasure that we carry around us in earthen vessels in this life. And which, you know, unifies us in spirit with Jesus Christ. It's glorious. So, now we're going to look at the betrothal period from the perspective of the bride. We're going to look at some things that relate to that. So we left off with the bridegroom leaving the church, Jesus leaving the church, leaving his Holy Spirit with her as a pledge that he would return for her. That's what a pledge was. That's how Paul describes the Holy Spirit, as a pledge. He will return. He will return for the church. So he's gone. And now there's this period of the betrothal. It's, it's a betrothal period. It's a time, period of time, about a year, could be less, could be more. No one really knew. Only, only the bridegroom's father knew the, the date or the hour in the Jewish marriage ceremony that the son, that the bridegroom would come back for his bride. So, He's left, he's gone away. The bride doesn't really know how long he's going to be away, but she knows it's going to be a long time for her from where she sits. And so, what does she do during this time? What are some things that Scripture points out that the church is to do that harmonize perfectly with what a typical uh, Jewish woman would do who's betrothed in her culture? the culture that Jesus is speaking to, grew up in, knows this this culture, the culture that Paul grew up in and knew and he's speaking about when he's talking to the church. Okay, so during the betrothal period, at the start of this betrothal beer, period, the bride is to begin preparing herself for her new life with her husband. Okay, she, she's not there yet, she doesn't know what it'll be like yet. She doesn't know all the details. She knows what her husband has told her about himself and about his father's family and so forth. She has those words to hold on to. But she doesn't really know for sure what it's going to be like yet. But she's preparing herself for what she has been told about it. So one of the interesting things to note is that a betrothed woman is taking the name of her husband as her own. And that that name is also the name of his father, which for the church is the name of God. And we take that as our own. And that way, I think that it's apt that we call ourselves Christians in, in that sense, that we are taking on the name of our Lord and Savior as our own. I am a Christian. Uh, that name that has unfortunately been tarnished in the world quite a bit, and by bad examples of people claiming to be Christians who actually uh, are not uh, followers of God. But I like that. I like that idea that we call ourselves by His name. We've taken His name as our own, with all of its stigma that it has for us in the world, but the glory that it has awaiting for us 
in the future. So names in the ancient world were of great importance. Okay, they're not so much today. I would say, particularly in the West where I live, names don't mean a lot. Your last name, so what? Right? What bearing does your last name have on your life? Whereas in the ancient world, it had everything. You know, in the ancient world, um, the name that a family had carried the legacy of that family. It carried a huge weight with it. It enshrined the reputation of your family, the honor due your position, your it, it carried with it the business that your family did in the world. So many things were hereditary in the past. You didn't have the Western idea that you can be anything and do anything that we have today. At that time, and throughout most world history, actually, you didn't have that choice. If you were born into the family of goat herders, chances nine times out of ten, you're going to be a goat herder. If you were a cobbler, nine times out of ten, you, if your father was a cobbler, you'd be a cobbler. If, you know, if you were a stonemason or a jeweler, you worked with precious metals and precious gems, you would be coming up into that and carrying on that legacy. So even in the West today, you know, you've got businesses that are father and sons, right? That That's a carryover from that time where the name that a person had said something about who they were in the world and what they were about. So we can see that in a biblical sense with the tribe of Levi, for example. Everyone born into the tribe of Levi were to be priests, right? They couldn't say, well, I want to be king. You know, no kid could say, I don't want to be a priest. I want to be a, you know, a king or a prince or something like that. No, in the tribe of Judah, likewise, the tribe of Judah, if you were born into that tribe, chances were you'd be in leadership in some way or another. So you couldn't say, well, I want to be a priest. You couldn't do that. Your name, the name of your family, the name of your people carried with it all of this baggage about who you are and what you do in the world. And you are to carry that on, that reputation. So in the same way that a bride, when she's coming into her, her adoptive father's household, when she's taking on the name of her husband, is taking all of this upon herself. So we as Christians, as followers of Christ, as believers, as the bride ourselves, we are taking on Christ's name. And all, all that that comes with that, that we are bearing in that name. And so as such, a bride would want to know as much about her husband and his family as possible to help her prepare herself for that immense burden and honor. I mean, it's honorable, especially if, if the family you're marrying into is honorable. <laughs> for the church, what could be more honorable than marrying into the family of God, right? Becoming part of the family of God. That's incredible. So she wants to know what are the expectations. She's bearing she's going to be bearing his character and the character of his family. I think that Jesus kind of speaks into this in John chapter 16, starting in verse 12. Here he's preparing to go to the cross, and he's preparing ultimately, you know, once he's resurrected and once he's with his disciples and then he leaves, he's preparing to go back to his Father. And so he says in John chapter 16, verse 12, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them at the present time. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take from Mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are Mine. This is why I said that He takes from Mine and will disclose it to you. So Jesus is speaking about the Holy Spirit, which we saw last time is the pledge to the church that seals her. 
the pledge, the first installment of all the future blessings in Jesus Christ. And so it's a foretaste of those things that we have waiting for us. And so the Spirit will guide the bride into all the truth and help her understand what the character of Jesus is, what the character of God the Father is, what the expectations are, like how how they walk, what what, what they're about. And so the Holy Spirit does that for the church. Now the Holy Spirit does that through God's Word, as we'll see. That's a key distinction. It's not like the Holy Spirit's just sort of freely downloading all of this new revelation into the church's brain, into her mind as she's in her betrothal period. But it's the words that were spoken to the church while he was with her before he left. And that's what we have in the Word of God. In the New Testament, we have actually the words that he spoke while he was with his bride. Exactly like how it would be with a Jewish bride. She wouldn't have a lot more to go on once her husband left her. She would just have what he told her and she'd be thinking about that and focusing on it and trying to trying to match her conduct to what he had shared with her. So the Holy Spirit serves that function, helping us to understand His words to us, to grow in our understanding of what the expectations of God's household are, how we are to walk, how we are to be, during this period of our sanctification where we're setting ourselves apart more and more to be like Him, we're working the sinful learned deeds of our former life, we're working those out, the Holy Spirit's working those out of the church and working the fruit of the Spirit into her life. Okay, the other thing that we see here in John chapter 16 that's really important is Jesus talking about the Spirit again. He will guide you into all the truth, in verse 13, for he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take from mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. This is why I said that he takes from mine and will disclose it to you. So this is beautiful because he's saying that the Holy Spirit will take what is Jesus and disclose it to us. So it makes so much more sense that as we approach this verse from the perspective of the bride and the bridegroom because what is Jesus's does not belong to a stranger. It does not belong to people who have nothing to do with them. It doesn't have anything to do with them. It doesn't belong to them. But it belongs to his bride. His bride belongs to him. And so we see that echoed here beautifully. All things that the Father has are mine. This is why I said he takes from mine and will disclose it to you. So all things that the Father has belong to Jesus Christ. Right? They're related. They're one in name. They're, they're one in nature. Right? They're not one in name. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But they're one in nature. Father and Son. And so everything that the Father has belongs to Jesus Christ. And then he says, this is why I said he takes what's mine and he discloses it or gives it to you. Because we're related to him now. We belong to him. We're part of this family. That's beautiful. I'm, it's so encouraging to, to, to hear that in Scripture and to see that. So, I mentioned that the, the Word of God is the means by which the Holy Spirit discloses the character of God to the bride, to the church. And that's borne out in Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 12. The author says, The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom 
we must answer. <clears throat> okay? So that's the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 6.17 says this, The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Okay, so the Word of God is the sword wielded by the Spirit. Okay, it's the tool by which the Holy Spirit penetrates as far as the division of soul and spirit, able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. Right? And that's both ways. That's both directions. Sometimes we can think that Hebrews is just talking about the Holy Spirit wielding that sword through us towards non-believers and towards the world. But it's also, it's double-edged. It's also towards us. It's convicting us of sin, righteousness, and judgment in our sanctification, our period of sanctification, to help us grow to be more like Jesus. And I personally think that that's what, as a quick aside here, I think it was um, Anna in the temple uh, when she's prophesying and she tells Mary. It, it's it's either Anna or um, the other uh, the other elderly the elderly man. I can't remember his name. I'm blanking on it right now. Who also talks about it? I can't remember who, but he it says a sword will pierce your own heart to Mary. And some people think that that means the pain at the death of Jesus Christ. But I don't think that's what it's referring to, because Jesus is resurrected. It doesn't make a lot of sense that that would be the, the context of that. I think that it's referring to, through Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into the world, and a sword will pierce even Mary's heart as mother, mother of this child, mother of the Son of God, that that sword of the Spirit will pierce even her heart, as it does every believer, as it does every one of us, to begin that work of sanctification in our lives, that conviction in our lives. That's just an aside. I take it that way. Um, if you take it differently, that's perfectly fine as well. So, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And the Word of God is being used by the Spirit in our lives to help the bride prepare herself, understand what's in the name, what's in the name that she's taking on, what character she is going to be, she needs to learn to uphold, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the word of God to those who don't belong to God, who are not part of the bride, to them it's meaningless. What, is, what does it mean? I mean, I think the Word of God convicts the world, still regardless, but to them it's foolishness. But to the bride, to those being saved, it is the power of God. So the Word of God is very important. And the pledge that Jesus has given us, the Holy Spirit, teaches us and brings to our understanding the knowledge of God through the Word of God. The words that Jesus left us spoke to us before He left. It's just like a husband would speak promises to his bride in Jewish custom and tell her about the future and tell her about the things that will be and tell her about what he values and what he loves and what he likes and she will listen to that and keep that close to her in her life and remind herself of that constantly and the pledge that he the pledge that a husband would leave his bride would remind her of these things so the point of all of that is the church is not left without help in her duty during this time of sanctification to conform her life, her ways, her former ways, to her husband's ways, to the ways of his household, to the ways of his father's household. That's kind of her role, to work out the things that she has lived in and done and practiced and conform to the ways of his household. and. That's the bride's duty. 
So I want to talk a little bit at this point, just about during this period of time that the bridegroom is away, there is a security that the bride has. She has a security in her position that she belongs to the bridegroom. And she has a security knowing that nothing, nothing will change that. There's commitment in the Jewish uh, marriage process that is missing in the Western process. You know, for example, in the Western marriage ceremony in the you know Western European, the Western world is what I'm referring to. You engage yourself to uh, a husband or a future husband or a future wife, but there's no commitment at that point. The the person you're planning on marrying may do something you don't like or may say things you don't like or may behave in ways you don't like while you're engaged and you say, you know what, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to marry you after all because I don't like this behavior. That was not true in the Jewish marriage ceremony. When you were betrothed, after you were betrothed, you were legally bound as husband and wife, and you were considered one spirit, one soul with each other. There was commitment. There's no way out of it now. And so I think that talking about security for the church is an important topic. And I know that some of you listening may have different views on this. There are different views on security in the church. I have close friends of mine in the faith who believe that you can fall away, you can lose your salvation. Once you're saved, once you belong to Jesus, you can fall away and lose all of that. I don't believe that. I think that the Word of God is pretty clear that once you belong, those who do belong to Jesus cannot lose that position that they have in Jesus Christ. Um, I think that that's borne out in Scripture. And I think that it's borne out through the examples God gives us of adoption and betrothal in particular to help us understand our relationship to God. There's security in both of those um, realities that God gives us to help us understand this. So, I want to talk a little bit about that. And you may disagree, and that that's, that's fine. I mean, it's not a salvation issue. I don't break fellowship and we shouldn't break fellowship over disagreements of this nature and I actually appreciate fellow believers who have this position that one could lose your salvation because they remind me from time to time how is your relationship with the Lord is it healthy is it good and I appreciate that so that I don't get lulled into a sense of of um you know, that I can just live my life however I want with no consequences, because I do believe that there are there are consequences, it's just not in terms of position. To clarify, uh, Paul in Corinthians talks about the the works that we do as believers, as Christians, and are we doing precious stones? Is that the works that we're doing that are precious to God, that are valuable to God in our lives? Or are we doing wood, hay, and stubble in our lives? Things that are worthless to him. Is that our focus as believers? And yet in that example, as Paul is describing it, even those who, or the work that they do as Christians is worthless to God, they are still saved. But it says, as one who pass, has passed through fire, burned perhaps, but all of their works are burned up, and are meaningless to God, and they, they have nothing left over, but they are saved. So is that picture. I think that scripture is pretty pretty clear on that. Another caveat that I want to, to make is that there, there can be some nuanced language here in terms of what we mean by saved. And so some people believe that anyone who professes to be saved, who says a prayer and says, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, is saved, like actually saved. Um, I don't think the scripture bears that up. There are those who are truly saved, who are born again, who are a new creation, who are adopted by the Heavenly Father as His adopted sons. 
and betrothed to Jesus Christ as his bride, those belong to Jesus Christ. God knows who those are because he can see the heart. I can't see your heart. I can't see someone else's heart. I can't know if they've genuinely professed faith in Jesus Christ. And so when we see people who have professed Christ and then they walk away from the faith or fall away, it can lead us to think, oh, well, they were saved and then they fell away and lost their salvation. But from the perspective that I think is biblical, I don't know if that person was ever saved. I don't know if they ever actually were truly committed from the heart. Only God knows that. Because it's an issue of the heart. And God can see the heart, but I can't. So that's just a picture when I am talking about I don't think that b true believers can, can lose that security that they have in Christ. I'm not talking about just anybody who professes. And I think I think Jesus actually points this out, you know, when he told the parable about the judgment, and there were many there who said, Lord, you know, we cast out demons in your name, and we prophesied in your name, and we did all this stuff for you. And what does Jesus say to them? Depart from me, you, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. He didn't say, you served me for a while and then you fell away, or I knew you for a while, but you didn't continue in the faith. You weren't continuing in it. No, he says, I never knew you. There was never a point in time ever where they where they ever were known by Jesus Christ, even though they outwardly did signs and wonders in his name and professed his name to f maybe fool many of us. So that's just an aside. I personally believe in security. I think scripture bears it out. But I understand there is some some ambiguity. There there are some verses that are difficult to understand. Um, even from what I feel is the more secure position of believing in security. And I think that God's example to us of the bride gives us a picture of that security. So we'll continue on with that. And again, if you disagree that's perfectly fine. Just, I hope that you would listen to what I have to say. If you disagree at the end of it, you know you're still, you're still a brother or a sister to me. We're still members of the body of Christ. So let's continue with this. So although the bride has this, the work to do, she has these works to do during her betrothal period, during this year-long period. There's a lot that she needs to do. She needs to be working on her behavior and her attitudes and preparing herself for marriage and getting herself ready and looking ahead to that time and taking on the character of her husband and the character of his, his household. While she's doing that, it's important to note that her position as wife as a betrothed wife, is not dependent on those works. Okay, so she, it, it's not like Jesus is going to, you know, dismiss her because she didn't do a good job working during this betrothal period on the, on the things that she should have been doing. Okay, just like in the Jewish marriage ceremony, a husband couldn't dismiss his wife couldn't divorce her, couldn't annul the marriage if she didn't do a great job during this betrothal period of conforming to his expectations, conforming to his character, conforming to his nature. So there is security here in this picture of the betrothal. And I think that that, that can be encouraging to us. It can be encouraging to us to know that we belong to him. We are his through the horrors and trials of this life that we go through. We belong to him. We have that security of knowing he didn't go away and he changed his mind and he's not coming back, right? We have that security of knowing he is returning for us. He is returning for his bride. We have been chosen by him and betrothed to him. And I think... Also, it's important to note, he knew what he's getting into, you know. He, he, you know, he chooses his church. It's not like, oh, you're not who I thought you were. That That's not going to happen. He knows who we are. 
and yet he betrothed himself to to the church regardless, knowing we were, you know, messed, sinful, we still fall into sin, we still fall into disgrace and all kinds of mess, and yet he still loves us and betrothed himself to us, helping us work through that and be sanctified to be more like him. So I want to recall at this point that in the Jewish betrothal custom, the only way to annul it, there was a way, the only way to annul it that Jesus gives us room to do was if one of them was unfaithful to the other. Okay, so if one, if the husband or the wife committed adultery during this period of sanctification, then that was a way, that was the only way that it could be annulled. So let's think about that for a little bit. The church knows, we know, as the members of the body of Christ, we will never have cause to bring an accusation of unfaithfulness to, towards Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ is faithful. That's his very name. He's faithful. He's God. He never sins against his church. Okay, so we have no cause to bring against him of unfaithfulness. And the important thing to understand here is that Jesus has promised us that he will remain faithful even if we are faithless. That can sound bad on the surface, like, whoa, wait a second, what? What are you saying here? So I want to read Second Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 11, and then we'll get into it, and I think you'll agree and understand what we're saying here by the end of it. So Second Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 11, Paul says, The statement is trustworthy, for if we died with him, speaking of Jesus, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Okay, so on the surface there, it almost seems like verse 12 and verse 13 are contradicting each other, right? If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Right. So it's important to understand that that first one, if we deny him, he will also deny us, is speaking to the broader context of where denial is used in Scripture. When you look at what it means to deny Christ, it's to deny the call of salvation. That's my understanding of it in Scripture. To deny Christ is to deny the call of salvation. It's not necessarily saying that we once belonged to him, we were his, and then we turned away from him. Okay, So I don't take it to be that way. Um, let me know if you do, if you think otherwise, in the comments. But I think that scripture bears that out, that to deny him. Because um, the condemnation, you know, that Jesus speaks about is denying him. And he's talking about salvation coming to the world in John when he talks there about that. I don't remember the, the exact uh, chapter and verse right now. Maybe later I'll get back to that. So I think that the denying, if what he's saying there is if we, if people deny Jesus, he will deny them. Okay, I think that's very clear. The next verse is the one I think that's speaking to the church. If we're faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Okay? So I want you to think about that for a moment. Just like a father of a bridegroom would work out the bride price for his son's bride to give, him, to give his son a, a wife in the Jewish custom. Because in the Jewish custom, the father of the bridegroom would arrange and negotiate the bride price to purchase the bride for his son. Just in that sense, Jesus says this in John chapter 10, starting in verse 28. He says, And I give them, speaking of 
believers of the church, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So he's saying that everyone who is his cannot be taken away from him. They belong to him. The Father gave them to Jesus. No one can take, take them. No one can take believers away from Jesus. I, I think that extends to powers and principalities and, and all of those things. So you can read, you know, Satan cannot snatch the church out of my hand. It's a very beautiful, beautiful verse there. Also, John chapter 6, earlier in John chapter 6, verse 38, starting there, Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of everything that he has given me, I will lose nothing, but will raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. So there you have again, even stronger than the last passage, I think, the security being referenced that those who are Christ's cannot be lost. Jesus will not lose them. They belong to him. And they will be raised up to eternal life on the last day. Okay, so there's security there. And I think that that's pretty clear in my own understanding of of the Word of God. So, getting back to the first statement, if the bride is faithless during her time of purification, her time of sanctification, Christ remains faithful to her. Okay. Again, that, that can sound a little problematic. Like, what are you saying? Do you say we can sin all we want and there's no consequences? Absolutely not. There are consequences. There are some, you know, severe consequences. I already mentioned in Corinthians where Paul talks about losing all everything that you've ever done in your life, losing it all, burned up, worthless. You have no inheritance except for the fact that you are saved. You have you have that, the crown of life, but you have nothing else. You have no other inheritance for the good works and the good deeds. No reward for the good works and the good deeds that you could have done in life. So there are consequences. And I think that that is, those are severe. But let's look at this. If the bride is faithless, Christ remains faithful to her. I think that's true because obviously when we think about it a little bit more, because from the beginning of the church, when the church was formed to this present day, right now, this very day, every member of the body of Christ, every member of the church, every member of the bride has been at times unfaithful and sinned against God. Because all sin is unfaithfulness to God. And so when we have an outburst of anger towards someone, or we do something selfish for ourselves that harms another person, you know, or we have an impure thought, or something like that, that is all sin. And sin is unfaithfulness to God. It is unfaithfulness to Jesus. And so we are faithless in that sense from time to time. Not, not as like our entire being were faithless, but we have moments of unfaithfulness to Jesus, and he remains faithful to us through that, as we'll read in scripture here. But we all have sinned against him, which is why we are instructed to confess those sins to Jesus. We're not, the bride is not perfected yet, we're not in our glorified, resurrected bodies that we will be given when Christ comes back for his church. And we will be raised from the graves and perishable. And those who are still alive will be changed and will meet him in the air. Just like the 
the bridegroom would not come into the bride's father's house to get her. He would be off nearby somewhere and she would have to go to him. It's so beautiful. Paul describes the same thing. Jesus doesn't touch the earth at this point. We meet him in the air and then we will forever be with him. And so I think that that's, that's another little beautiful nugget there that we'll get into in this study near, near the end, looking at that. But we're not perfected yet. We still live in this body of flesh and the desires of the flesh still wage war on our members and so forth as Paul describes. And so we still struggle with sin. The point is we're struggling because if we didn't have the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't be struggling against sin. But because God has given us the Holy Spirit and we belong to Him, we struggle against it. And so we do fall into sin. But we don't, we don't want to live that way. We don't want to be that way. And we confess it to Jesus. As the church, we are faithless to Jesus at times, unfaithful to him in thoughts and in actions as we struggle with sin in this period of our sanctification. And in all of this, Jesus remains faithful to us and forgives us when we seek it, when we seek him. I mean, praise be to God, right? Praise be to him. First John chapter 1, verse 8, John says this, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Okay, so... If we argue that we have no sin in this period of sanctification, we're perfect, we're holy, we don't do anything wrong, we're deceiving ourselves. Because this, this whole period we are being sanctified, we're being made to be more like Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is working out the learned behaviors that the bride has from the world that she grew up in and working those out. So we should never say we have no sin. I have encountered people who claim to be believers who maintain they do not sin. They have never sinned since they become became Christians. That is patently false. I mean, John says so right here. But even in those engagements, I mean, the, the person and their the way they were expressing themselves and the way they were speaking were sinning against me. It's very dangerous to think that you don't have sin, that you do not sin in this life as a Christian, because then you'll have to make excuses for your sin to justify it as not sin. So you'll say, oh, I was just hungry. Uh, you know, I, di I didn't sin against you, it's just I was hungry. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed today. You know, I don't have to confess that bad behavior where I, I yelled at someone or behaved incorrectly or it was righteous indignation when I screamed and yelled at that person for not getting my order right at the, the drive through restaurant. Right? You have to excuse it. You have to make excuses for it. And that is a very dangerous place to be. So, John is saying, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. And that's true. It's a very dangerous place to be. So, don't say that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There it is right there. Right? If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, Paul said. And here, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous. So if we are unfaithful to him and we sin, he is faithful and righteous when we confess those sins to forgive us and cleanse us from all of that unrighteousness. Okay. It's beautiful. And just that it ends that verse by the same warning. 
If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. We never want to be in that situation of saying that, or arguing that we are sinless as Christians. First John chapter 2, so next chapter, starting in verse 1, John says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Okay, so the purpose that he's writing this letter to the church is to encourage them that they wouldn't sin. But he knows that as flawed human beings in this process of sanctification, <clears throat> We are going to sin. We are going to struggle with sin and fall into sin from time to time as we're working, as the Holy Spirit is working through us, sanctifying us. And so that's why he says, And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. By this we know that we've come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever follows his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says that he remains in him ought himself also walk just as he walked. Okay, that's an important very important verse there that the church must walk as he walked like that's our goal during this period of sanctification while we wait for his return we need to be learning to walk to walk just like he walked just like he walked and taught us in the word of god in his word we need to learn to walk like he walked and emulate that. So in these verses, John is reminding the church that the church still sins. She struggles with sin, and she still is she's unfaithful in that towards her husband, Jesus Christ, and against his father, our adoptive father, God our Father. And so we we do struggle with unfaithfulness in this church age, in this period of grace, in this period of the church's sanctification, in this betrothal period for the church. And that that's the whole point of the the, the concept of the period of sanctification in the Jewish marriage ceremony. This is a time of of setting yourself apart from your old life, setting yourself to learn the ways of oneness with your future husband as the bride. So the point of the period of sanctification for a bride is to get better at these things, working out the learned behaviors that are not acceptable, that her husband takes no pleasure in, right? So for the church, we're working out those learned behaviors that we've gained from the world. Remember, we, we set up in this study early on that before we were the church, we were lost children enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world who by nature are not gods even though they rule the world as if they are gods, you know, spiritual powers of darkness and so forth. And we've grown up in that with all these bad learned behaviors of sin and unrighteousness and then we're saved by Jesus Christ. He pays the bride price from us and sets us free from all of that and takes us to himself to be his. And now during this period of sanctification we are unlearning and working out. It's the Holy Spirit really that's doing the work but we're, we are also working towards getting better at this. The Holy Spirit's working out all of these bad, sinful behaviors that we have learned from the world. And that Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is our helper in that process. He's our pledge. 
He's sealed us in Christ. He's our comforter. He's our helper. Those are words used in Scripture to describe the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, you know, one of the Holy Spirit's roles is reminding the bride of who she is now. She belongs to Jesus. She belongs to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He's going to come back for her. And they're going to be together. We are going to be with Christ for all eternity. So, this period of sanctification, to wrap up this, it's not a works-based righteousness. She's not doing these, these works of trying to conform herself to the behavior of Christ out of, out of uh, work to be acceptable to him and remain his wife. Okay? That might be how the, the Western European marriage tradition is, right? But that is not the way that the Jewish marriage ceremony was. There's security for her. She's been chosen by him. She's, she belongs to him. She's not doing these things in order to be his wife. She's doing it to please him because she loves him. So, the church will devote herself, just like a bride would, to this work while Jesus is away from her during this period of time of her sanctification. Namely, she's following his word that he gave to her while he was with her 2,000 some years ago. And we have that. We have that in the word of God. And what Jesus shared with us were those things about what is acceptable to him, what is acceptable in his father's house, what's pleasing to him. Righteousness, love, peace, justice, holiness, the fruit of the Spirit, all of those things are the character of God and of Jesus, God the Father, God the Son. And so we have that. We have His words, and so we need to follow His words and grow in being more like Him and conforming to His ways and the ways of the household of God which we now belong to. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 34 the, the second part of that verse Paul is talking about human marriage here but I think that it's interesting that it applies to the church just like earlier when he's talking about human marriage he kind of interweaves the fact that that Christ is the husband to the church and the church is the wife to Christ and he's weaving that in to help us understand our relationship to Jesus is is like our relationship in in human marriage and so here in 1st Corinthians chapter 7 verse 34 he's talking about those who are married he says that their concern their concern and the concern for a, a, a woman is how she may please her husband. Right? Like that's what she's focused on in her life. How she may please her husband. And so that's in like manner that relates to the church, right? The church must be living her life with that as her goal, as her perspective, how she may please Jesus. That's her desire in her heart. And so we as the church, that should be our focus. To walk like he walked while he was with her. And that's all in preparation for when we're joined with him. That when we're united with him, in the end, when the church is resurrected and we're all with, with him, for all eternity united with him, right? That we walk, we're able to walk with him, right? You know, no, no bride, no bride in any tradition <laughs> around the world wants to be embarrassed uh, in her behavior, right? In her 
in her father-in-law's house, in her husband's house, that her behavior does not comport to their behavior. It's, it's, it's not right. It causes disharmony. It's not in harmony with the ways of her husband and his family. I think we can think of comedic stories that we probably all have all around the world where a woman meets her um, future in-laws for the first time, maybe, and she embarrasses herself by saying all the wrong things and doing all the wrong things and, you know, causes them offense in her behavior because she's behaving inappropriately in a way that isn't appropriate to how they live their lives and what they value. So the church doesn't want to be that way. So our focus is to be pleasing to Jesus, to be pleasing to God the Father. We want to dedicate ourselves to His Word. We want to listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives that is teaching us and instructing us what is pleasing to the Lord. We want to practice in our lives emulating Him and walking as He walked so that we will walk gracefully with Him when we're with Him and bring glory to Him and to God. Okay, so that kind of wraps up that particular topic about what the bride is taking on herself, taking on His name, taking on Christ's character, and working on that, and working out her learned behaviors that are bad. So now let's move on to the members of the body of Christ. Paul teaches a lot about this in Scripture, and this is actually, for me, it was greatly illuminated when I approached it from the context of the Bride of Christ, for me anyways. So Paul brings us this teaching of the many members of the body of Christ. And I think that this concept has sometimes confused people over the years, but I think, thankfully, Paul explains in Ephesians that when he is referring to the body of Christ, he's referring to the bride. Okay, And I didn't really understand this. In fact, I've written teachings in, in the church in the past where I described the body of Christ as like making up the body of Christ. Like we're all members of his body as, as it's kind of understood by others as well. But that's not really the context that Paul is talking about as I dug into it more. So, Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 22. Paul says, Wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. So there's a body of, of Christ there. This are the body of the church. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Okay, so that ties into that verse. He himself being the Savior of the body. Whose body? His church. He's the Savior of the church. The body of the church. Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are parts of his body. There it is. So that's the concept of the body of Christ. And yet the context where Paul is talking about that, he's talking about the bride. And the bride, her body in a, in a marriage, in the, in the Jewish marriage custom, 
the body of the bride belongs to her husband and vice versa and so we are parts of his body we belong to him he is the savior of the body so that's that's the context and so that context I think can help us now as we dig into Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 speaking to the members the members of the body the members of the body of Christ which is all of us we are all members of the church we're all members of the body that makes up the church which is the body of Christ so Ephesians chapter 4 starting in verse 11 and he speaking of God gave some as apostles in the church some as prophets some as evangelists some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ okay so again not not this picture of like we are members of Christ's body but we are his bride which belongs to him which is his body right one 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 soul one spirit one flesh that's marriage until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ as a result we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of people by craftiness and deceitful scheming but speaking the truth in love we are to grow up in all respects into him who is the head that is Christ from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love okay so there's, there's a lot there but recall there we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head that is Christ that is again referring back to Ephesians earlier where he's talking about Christ is the head of the church just like husband is the head of the wife again it's the marriage terminology is in here it's harmonious it fits and it actually makes more sense of this as we go along I think it, it's helped me in this so in a broader picture what are we seeing here we've seen that in the church it's not a carbon copy um, assembly line where every Christian is boom 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 stamped out exactly the same that God gives each member of the body of Christ different gifts different purpose in the church it's all to his glory and it's all in harmony with scripture and teaching and not something crazy like circus performer or something like that but it's apostles prophets evangelists pastors teachers etc he gives all of that different members of the body of the bride of Christ okay verse 17 so I say this and affirm in the Lord that you are no longer to walk just as the Gentiles also walked in the futility of their minds being darkened in their understanding excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of their heart right and they having become callous have given themselves up to indecent behavior for the practice of every kind of impurity and greediness but you did not learn Christ in this way if indeed you've heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus okay this is very important here this is what we've been talking about you are no longer to walk in the formal way that you walked as a bride you need to unlearn that behavior and Paul's getting to that you did not learn that kind of behavior in Jesus okay so you have no excuse you need to unlearn this behavior and you need to learn the behavior of Jesus that's what Paul is saying here to the bride okay if indeed you've heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus 
that in reference to your former way of life, you are to rid yourselves of the old self, right? The bride is supposed to do that, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Right? It's beautiful. It fits so well with what we've been looking at with the marriage ceremony. Verse 25, Therefore, ridding yourself of falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, because we are parts of one another. Right? That's a picture that the, the bride of Christ is made up of many different members. And Paul's going to get in, into that here soon. But the hands and the feet, and you know, we're all different functions in the church. We need to recognize that. We are parts of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. The one who steals must no longer steal, but rather he must labor, producing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the, the one who has need. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but if there is any good word for edification according to the need of the moment, say that, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Isn't that beautiful? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. The pledge that Jesus gave us, the pledge he gave his bride to help her and to remind her of him and to bring to remembrance to her everything that he said. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by pursuing and living in your former ways that are not acceptable to Christ that are not acceptable in the Father's household. Okay, You were sealed by that Spirit as His, as belonging to Him for that day of redemption at the end of this, this period of sanctification, this betrothal period when you are united with Him. That's that day of redemption when our bodies are redeemed just as our spirits have been we've been redeemed spiritually and united with Jesus in spirit but not yet in body and that day of redemption is at the end of this period of time this period of sanctification all bitterness wrath anger clamor and slander must be removed from you along with all malice be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So beautiful. So we need to think that way about the other members of the bride, the other members of the body of Christ, to behave that way towards them in forgiveness and love. So just as a husband is in as Paul has explained, Paul says this, just as the husband is the head of the wife, we find that Jesus is the head of his church. And I think that that helps us understand that the text we just read is speaking to a betrothed bride, preparing herself for her husband during that period of sanctification. She must let go her former life, which she has sworn to forsake. I mean, baptism is symbolic of this, that we are forsaking our former life, we're washing it away, and we're setting ourselves apart for our bridegroom, for Jesus. You know, we've sworn to forsake it. And in becoming one spirit with our husband, now we must focus all of our attention on pleasing Jesus. Okay, we find a similar topic in 1 Corinthians here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so how that opens there. 
I think it's interesting. He's pointing out that you were pagans. You didn't belong. You know, you were enemies of God at one point. You were led astray. That's the context, remember? That was our former life. Verse 4. Now, <clears throat> there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, he's speaking of in the church. But the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So that's kind of adding a lot more detail to what we read before, that in the church the Holy Spirit, God, is, you know, there are many members in the body that have different functions, and the Spirit is providing that, distributing that to the members as God sees fit. Verse 12, For just as the body is one, and yet has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. And I think he's referring to what belongs to Christ, the body of Christ, the church. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Right? The baptism is... We're, we are being baptized into one Spirit. And our bodies now belong to Jesus. And we, the church, in our baptism are being baptized into one body. The body of Christ, the bride. We all belong to the bride. Right? There's not two brides or three brides or four brides. There's one. It's the church. We're all one. For by one spirit you were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. So, brothers and sisters, wherever you are in the world right now, you know, if you're in the, the Philippines or Japan or China or Africa or Europe or South America or the United States and you are a believer, you belong to the Bride of Christ, we're all one body. We all have the same pledge. We all have the same spirit in us that unite us to Jesus in spirit. We're one. And that's beautiful. Verse 14. For the body is not one part, but many. If the foot says, Because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, Because I am not an eye, I am not part of the body, it is not for that reason any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now, God has arranged the parts, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. And if they were all one part, where would the body be? But now there are many parts, but one body. That's the bride. Okay? So we're not all preachers. We're not all teachers. You know, we're not all given to the the gift of service. We're not all given to these things in the church. Some of us, the Holy Spirit gives different gifts. We're different members of the same body, but we all are one body, the bride. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the parts of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Right, so this is again a, a temptation throughout the history of the church to exclude people and to say, we don't need you here. We don't need that here. 
right? You're not acceptable here because you don't fit our criteria of whatever. You know, different churches in the world can come up with criteria that aren't, that aren't really biblical and then push people out who don't fit their criteria, right? And Paul is saying that's not right. That's not right. And those parts of the body which we consider less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our less presentable parts become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable parts have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that part which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the parts may have the same care for one another. And if one part of the body suffers, all the parts of, of the body suffer with it. If a part is honored, all the parts rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body, and individually parts of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, and various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts. So I want to, it's very important up here that if one part of the body suffers, all the parts suffer with it. We know that with our own physical bodies, right? I mean, if, if you stub your toe, you, you hurt your foot, Oh my goodness, you're miserable. You're miserable. You can't walk around. You can't hardly do anything, right? Um, you jam your, your thumb in a door. Ooh, man, that just makes your whole day ruined, right? So it's that same way with the members of the body. If one member of the church is suffering, we all suffer because of it. And if one part is honored, we're all honored in that. And so, with the concept of the Bride of Christ, we'll dig into that a little bit more. You know, the church belongs to Jesus. It's His. Her body is His body, even though they're not yet joined as one body. And a betrothed bride, you know, this is just a, I think, a fact of life. A betrothed bride desires to nourish all the parts of her body for her husband during her time of sanctification as she's preparing for the wedding day, right? Like that's a big thing in a lot of cultures that the women are focusing on beautifying themselves and getting themselves ready for their wedding day. It's a big deal because they want to be pleasing to their husband and be seen as beautiful and be beautiful to him on that day. And I think that that's the picture that that Paul is sharing here that the church wants all the parts of the church, all the members of the church, to be nourished and taken care of and beautiful for the Lord, and that we don't neglect any one member of the body. She should neglect some parts for other parts of her body in her desire to be wholly beautiful to her husband. I think that it seems kind of obvious and it's kind of silly to come up with examples like this, but no bride should neglect you know, the strength of her legs and the strength of her feet while she's all focused on her hands. Like she thinks her hands are, are beautiful, but she doesn't spend any time working on on walking, right? So then she's too weak to walk beside her husband and walk with her husband to the wedding feast right? And a bride whose hands grow weak because she hasn't been doing any kind of work with them during her sanct period of sanctification, she's totally focused on her feet, she'll have problems too. So you don't, it's that picture that Paul's creating that we want all the parts of the, of the church, all the members of the church to be beautiful and healthy and taken care of, to be presentable to Christ. You know, a truly devoted woman in the Jewish ceremony who's in love 
desires her whole self to be at its best for her husband. You know, because, let's be honest, he will see it all. He will see her and know it all once they are married. She can't hide anything from him. Like she's been able to maybe hide it from others. The proof of neglect will be there. The proof of uncleanness will be there. So the church during this period of time is wise to care for the body of Christ and to ensure that all the members, to, to give energy and time, all the members are being looked after, all the members are pleasing to the Lord and functioning so that she will be pleasing. We will be pleasing to Jesus and beautiful. So the church. The church must show love to all her members during this period of sanctification. So they are all beautiful and all pure and presentable and so that she is Ephesians 5 27, sacred part of that verse, in her glory having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. That should be the desire of the church. To be holy and to blameless, having, having no spot or wrinkle, being beautiful for her husband when he comes to take her away with him to the wedding feast. So I think in application of this, each member of us, the members of the body of Christ, should desire the function and beauty of all the other members of the body. So when I'm in church and I'm looking at someone else in the body, I think, wow, they, you know, huh, right? I think we all can be judgmental at times, right? We should not think that way. We should instead think, of how can I help that person to grow in their faith, grow in wanting to be more like the Lord. Mature. How can I help that? I think this is why um, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 2, he says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his trickery, your minds will be led astray from the sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Okay, So Paul is saying that, first of all, betrothal is there. And this is one of the key verses that's beautiful to see, that Paul sees the church as betrothed to Jesus. Okay, And his desire is that the church would be presented pure pure to him all of its members all the whole church in its in its wholeness would be presentable to him as pure and holy and beautiful but he was afraid that they would be led astray from that sincere pure devotion to the bridegroom that they're supposed to be about during this time. So Paul personally looked at the churches as he ministered as the betrothed bride of Christ, not simply as a metaphor or an illustration. I mean, he's clear. This is how he thinks about the church. And his desire was that she would keep herself pure so that she would be presentable to Christ in purity and beauty. But he worried about it. He worried that the church at Corinth, who he's talking to here, was being distracted from her pure devotion and love for Jesus during that time of sanctification while she waited for him to return and that this distraction would cause to fade what had made her beautiful and pleasing to Christ through her sin resulting sin and impurity and I think nothing is more displeasing to Christ than the effect on the health of the church when its members fight amongst themselves and disparage and neglect each other and they don't think they need or don't want certain members of the body 
and the result is crippling and blinding and muting and deafening or maiming the church. All of those descriptions Paul uses about the members of the body, the eye, the ear, the hand, the foot, all those members are useful and necessary for the body. And so we don't want to be doing that in the church, crippling and blinding and muting and deafening and maiming the church by disparaging and neglecting and fighting amongst ourselves and not showing love. Jesus wants all the members of his body to show love to one another, to build up the body of the church so that it is whole and perfect and pure in excellent health, lacking nothing, showing care and devotion to each part for the beauty of the whole. The next portion here that we're going to look at is the bride's wedding garment. And this is a big subject, so we're actually going to stop here and we'll pick this up in the next video. Because during the period of sanctification also, one of the other big things the bride is supposed to do, in fact, one of the most important things, is to work on making her wedding garment for that wedding feast. So during this year-long period of time or so, she is to be sewing and making this garment to be presented beautiful to her husband. So what is that? What is this wedding garment? Does it relate to the church at all? You know, this is the Jewish ceremony. Does it relate to the church? Is there anything in Scripture that relates this wedding garment to the church? And the answer is absolutely. It's actually in the Word of God. So next time, we'll take a look at that. I pray that I pray that this finds you well, leaves you well, that you you meditate on God's word, you study God's word as it relates to these things and you grow you grow up in in him. As I am endeavoring myself to live my life more for him and direct my life to walk more like he walked. Ah oh man, I mess up all the time, but I confess it to him. I try to. I need to remind myself to do that more and I pray you do too. That we would all seek and desire to be pleasing to Him in all aspects as we grow up in Him in this period of sanctification to please Him. Until next time.